In this video, we cover Down syndrome, which is the most common genetic cause of intellectual disability. Down syndrome is caused by an additional copy or an additional portion of chromosome 21. We'll go through the, the um, consequences of this additional chromosome and review the potential mechanisms of pathophysiology as well. What we need to keep in mind is that by having an extra copy of a chromosome, we create issues from head to toe because chromosome 21 encodes a large number of genes which affect a variety of cells. So in this case, we're not just targeting muscles or connective tissue or the nervous system or the immune system, we're targeting the entire body. So we're going to see a host of issues in today's talk. So as I mentioned earlier, Down syndrome is caused by an extra copy or an extra portion of chromosome 21. In both cases, we have additional genetic material. That creates an imbalance in the number of copies of genes that we have. And that is an issue. Now, because we're dealing with an extra copy of chromosome 21, Down syndrome is also called trisomy 21. We're having three copies as opposed to the typical two copies of chromosome 21. Here you can see the incidence is somewhere around 120 per 100,000 births. Um, live births, that is. Now, the major risk factor for uh, Down syndrome is advanced maternal age. Let's have a look at the graph over here. There are kind of two sets of numbers that we're dealing with. The green line is showing you the incidence of Down syndrome across different maternal ages. So as you move along the x-axis from left to right, we're going from younger to older mothers. And what you'll see there is that the green line has a sharp upturn once we get into advanced maternal age. The strict definition of that would be 35 and older. Really we see the greatest risks once we're above 45 years of age. So certainly there's an increased risk with advanced maternal age. However, most births happen with younger mothers, not older mothers. So now we need to turn our attention to the blue bars. The blue bars are showing us the proportion of Down syndrome cases across maternal age groups. Here we can see uh, clearly the, the, the highest are there, so the peak is between 30 34 years old. Even though they have a lower risk per live birth than older mothers, there's just simply a greater proportion of births within that maternal age group. So yes, advanced maternal age is a risk factor for Down syndrome, but it's not the case that the majority of cases of Down syndrome are coming from older mothers, because very few people have children after the age of 45. The reason for this likely has to do with how gametes are produced. And in women, maternal meiosis uh, doesn't occur to completion. Instead, meiosis starts uh, and then halts in prophase one. So certainly you've heard before that uh, females are, are born with all of the eggs that they'll have for their entire life, and this is true. And those eggs are halted at prophase one. So what's going on in prophase one? Well, just a reminder, we have the cartoon over here. In prophase one, the homologous chromosomes match up and crossover events can occur. So let's say we have O chromosome 21. Now, of course, whenever we go through the S phase, we're going to synthesize that extra copy of DNA there. These will be held together at the uh, centromere there. And so this could be our maternal copy. And then mom got half her genome from dear old dad, so the paternal copy does the same thing 
Right, so we duplicate our DNA, so we have now two copies of chromosome 21 that have been duplicated. In prophase 1, these homologous chromosomes come together. to allow for the exchange of genetic material. That's what a crossover event is. So we can swap portions of the chromosome. So maybe we have a crossover here, so some of dad's chromosome gets put on over to mom's chromosome. And then, well, I guess there would be grandpa's and grandma's chromosome, right, because this is in the mother. But you can get crossover events. So these homologous chromosomes are held together for an extended period of time because we don't actually go through the rest of meiosis until sexual maturity. So then each round of the menstrual cycle we're going to create a new set of gametes. So one of those lucky contestants is going to then exit prophase 1, advance through meiosis 1, and then eventually meiosis 2 to create a haploid gamete. Because we're holding the chromosomes in such a long, uh, for such a long time attached to one another, this appears to create the, uh, sorry, increase the risk of what we call a non-disjunction event. So what we should do as we go through meiosis one is pull apart our homologous chromosomes. So we'll pull apart some of mom's and, and dad's chromosomes to one side. So in this case, we'll pull apart mom's and then we'll get dad's over here. Let me try to save some time. Uh, pulling apart of the chromosomes should give us this clean division where we now have the two sister chromatids for chromosome 21 in one of the cells, and two sister chromatids in the other cell. But with advanced maternal age, when those chromosomes have been stuck together for a longer period of time, we don't always properly pull our chromosomes apart, causing us to go through meiosis 1 and giving one of the gametes an extra set of chromosomes. So now whenever we go through meiosis 2 and pull apart our sister chromatids, we will now have in those gametes an extra copy of chromosome 21. Now this happens for other chromosomes, but the larger chromosomes are not tolerated in extra copies. These will lead to spontaneous abortions. So there are very few trisomies that can occur. Trisomy 21 is a prime example. And since I've already put together a slideshow on it, we'll focus on that one. Now, certainly advanced paternal age is a little bit of a risk, but not for full-on trisomy. The older you are, the worse everything works. And so the paternal risk seems to do with errors in the swapping of genetic material, not pulling the chromosomes apart. They just don't cleanly transfer the same amount. So in an older male, this crossover might not be equal. Rather than exchanging the exact same amount of genetic material, we might actually put a little less material onto one and a little extra genetic material onto the other, giving us additional copies of portions of the chromosome. But that's not the big risk. The big risk comes from non-disjunction events in older mothers. Now, as far as diagnosis goes, this often occurs before birth because of the routine uh, screening that we go through uh, for each pregnancy in this country. So during the first, uh, second, and third trimesters, uh, we're going to take a lot of ultrasounds, uh, first of all to confirm uh, pregnancy and then to see if there's any issues that are arising along the way and one issue could be Down syndrome. So during the first trimester one of the things that they're looking for would be signs of abnormal uh, cranial uh, or 
heart development. So one of the signs of Down syndrome is a thickening of uh, this fluid-filled sac that sits behind the neck. So this is a transient structure. That's that nuchal translucency. Uh, this seems to expand in cases of Down syndrome. Uh, we'll also potentially see an absent nasal bone during the first trimester. So facial abnormalities are something we're also uh, looking for there. Also changes in blood flow, whether it be within the heart or uh, the, the umbilical blood flow as well. Those are other things that we're looking for, but we use ultrasound to look for signs of uh, Down syndrome during gestation. So these can be detected in the first trimester. Uh, during the second trimester, we can screen for Down syndrome uh, by sampling a bit of mom's serum and looking for changes in things like alpha fetal protein, human chorionic gonadotropin, and unconjugated estrogen. We'll see a drop in the uh, alpha fetal protein and unconjugated estrogen and increase in the human chorionic gonadotropin. All of these are strongly suggestive of Down syndrome. And in fact, there are very low false positive and false negative rates. But still, the gold standard is to actually karyotype. Karyotyping is where we take out uh, the chromosomes when they're condensed, so as the cell is going through the cell cycle and actually just taking account how many chromosomes are there. This requires that we pull out genetic material from, uh, from the child. So we can do this by uh, taking it from uh, the uh, chorionic villus sampling, or we can do amniocentesis, depending on the age. We'll sample different things. These are not without risk. There's, of course, risk of infection. There's risk of damaging the developing fetus as well. So we're going to pull some cells uh, either that might be floating around in fluid or actually out of the developing child and then we'll line up the chromosomes and as you can see here that karyotype look on the bottom they line it up based on size that's how we number the chromosomes so uh, 1, 2, 3 all the way going to uh, 22 there and then we got our X and our Y in this case uh, it looks like it's from a young lady. We got two X chromosomes there. Look at chromosome 21. There's three copies of it. And that is an irrefutable uh, indication of Down syndrome. So the gold standard is actual karyotyping, but it's not without risk. So rather than karyotyping every uh, pregnancy, Instead, we do this routine imaging, very low risk with ultrasound analysis, very low risk of sampling a uh, mother's serum, slightly higher risk with the karyotyping. But if you're making a decision between keeping a pregnancy or not, it's good to have a 0% false positive and false negative rate. Even though 4% is quite low, it's still not zero. So we've got screens, and we've got our gold standard diagnostic test for diagnosing Down syndrome. So it all comes down to that extra copy of chromosome 21. And the thing about chromosome 21 is that every cell is going to use it. So we're going to see issues from head to toe. And here they are summarized for you, from head to toe. So we'll see musculoskeletal problems. We will see pulmonary cardiovascular problems. We'll see immune system problems. We'll also, of course, see neurodevelopmental and neurological problems as well. Now, Down syndrome is, uh, of course, going to cause uh, stereotypical craniofacial abnormalities. Some of these we can pick up through ultrasound. That allows us to detect uh, Down syndrome early on in the pregnancy, but these will carry on for the rest of uh, the, the child and then adult's life. The typical features that we see there would be the flattened nasal bridge, also a change in eye shape where there's an up slanting of this palpebral fissure here, um, creating kind of an 
an almond-shaped eye. The presence of epicanthic folds is another trait of Down syndrome. Now, that said, some uh, ethnic groups have epicanthic folds, such as East Asians, but white folks like myself, we typically don't have epicanthic folds, but these are more common in people with Down syndrome because of the craniofacial changes that occur. Not only do we see issues with the eyes and nose, but also the mouth as well. The upper jaw is small, uh, tongue a little bigger. This small jaw leads to that protruding tongue. And of course there's abnormalities uh, from head down to toe. In fact, abnormalities with the toes. A much larger space between the first and second toes. Uh, the, the fingers will be shorter and stubbier, and there may be some bending of the fifth digit. This is another thing that we'll look for in ultrasound. The musculoskeletal abnormalities can be summarized as just sort of loosey-goosey. That's one way of thinking about this. So, we see hypotonia, and we see ligament laxity. So, kind of um, weak, flaccid muscles and sort of... Um, weak, uh, uh, poorly elastic uh, ligaments. And this creates a variety of issues. Uh, for example, there's a couple of hip problems that I mentioned uh, in, in the notes, so we'll see some hip instability, and really instability at multiple joints. More relevant for this class is the atlantoaxial instability. So instability at the C1, C2 spinal levels. That can lead to displacement of the vertebrae. And as we can see over here in this image, that's not a good thing. The posterior displacement of the vertebral bodies will push on the spinal cord. Pushing on the spinal cord interferes with communication between the brain and spinal cord. Of course this will create some neck pain because we're pushing on the meninges and the meningeal branches of the spinal nerves will translate that into pain. There will also be sensory changes. Don't forget we have sensory tracts that take information from the body about tactile pain and temperature sensations and relay it to the brain. Of course, weakness will occur as well. We can get upper motor neuron signs in this case. We can also get ataxia. So, upper motor neuron signs are caused by compression of the corticospinal tract. That's the upper motor neuron communicating to a lower motor neuron, allowing me to consciously move my body about in space. My ability to stay upright, for example, and to carry out the movements that I'm thinking of in a coordinated fashion has to do with other tracts. One example is the vestibulospinal tract. So, from the vestibular uh, nuclei down into the spinal cord. And this helps keep me upright. But standing on two legs isn't as easy as we make it look after we learn how to do it. So you'll see a little bit of lack of coordination uh, potentially here. We can also compress some of those autonomic pathways, such as the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus, one of my favorites. So we might see things like incontinence as a result of this atlantoaxial instability. This is rare, one, maybe two percent of people with Down syndrome will have this, but it's an important consideration if you're working with this population to ensure that they have cervical spine stability. Because keep in mind, their musculoskeletal system is a bit loosey-goosey, so things can slip around. That weakness also creates abnormalities in the gait, where essentially what we're seeing is kind of a small, weak gait. So decreased push-off, um, decreased knee uh, flexion at the heel contact. These result in a smaller stride length and also the strides will be quicker because of decreased single limb support time. All of these have to do with really kind of weakness of the muscle, a decrease in muscle tone. The immune uh, disorders come in a variety uh, of, of types here, so one potential issue is leukemia. What we're looking at over here in this table is something called the standardized mortality ratio. To calculate that, we look at the number of deaths in one group and compare that to the number of expected deaths taken from the general population.
So if we have about the same amount of deaths in our group of interest and the general population, we'll get a standardized mortality ratio of 1. Anything greater than 1 suggests a higher risk of mortality in our group of interest. So leukemia, for example, has a standardized mortality ratio of about 17, ranging between 11 to 23. So somewhere between 11 to 23 more times, I'm sorry, somewhere between 11 to 23 times more likely to cause death in Down syndrome compared to the general population. So we see this, uh, in this case, cancer of the immune system. So we have leukemia. Um, other cancers don't seem to be at an elevated risk. If we look at the uh, standardized mortality ratio for any other type of malignancy, we get a, a standardized mortality ratio of 1.3. The range, the 95% confidence interval, is somewhere between 0.7 and 2. Notice that includes 1. So it's not a significant, it's not a statistically significant increase in mortality risk. Leukemia is not the only immune problem. We can also have autoimmune disorders. One example is celiac disease, where we have constant inflammation uh, within the GI tract, and this affects absorption, absorption of nutrients and fluid. Of course, the buildup of fluid uh, would explain the diarrhea that occurs. The bloating, fatigue, and anemia are likely explained by deficient uptake of nutrients. So if we're not pulling nutrients out of the digestive tract, they're going to continue on through, and the, uh, the microbes that live in the distal portions of our digestive tract are going to have more stuff to metabolize, and they'll create more gas as a result. Since we don't have the nutrients available to us, that's going to account for the fatigue and the anemia that results there. And the, the anemia that's relevant to the immune system here would be that um, lymphopenia, so a reduction in lymphocytes, so particularly the white blood cells. And that would explain the increased risk of infection. Increased risk of infection uh, creates the respiratory disease. Most certainly congenital heart disease, that's the third row there, is a major cause of death in folks with Down syndrome. We have a standardized mortality ratio of 94. But if you look at the actual uh, number of, of deaths there, it's actually more so caused by respiratory disease. But collectively, cardiopulmonary disease accounts for the lion's share of deaths. So somewhere greater than about 75% of deaths in Down syndrome are caused by cardiopulmonary pulmonary disease. It could be because of uh, congenital heart disease. That's why during the uh, ultrasound imaging we look for alterations in blood flow. So we look for cardiovascular dysfunction. We look for signs of congenital heart disease. The pulmonary aspect here has to do uh, more so with lung infection. Two things we're going to cause that lung infection here. The immune system disturbances from the last slide. That can increase the risk of infection. Also, a couple slides ago, loosey-goosey, hypotonia, so the weakness in respiratory muscles also increases the risk of lung infection. So, cardiopulmonary disease, major cause of death in Down syndrome, either because of inherited heart defects or acquired lung infections. Of course, in Down syndrome, one of the principal features is intellectual disability. And invariably, some degree of intellectual disability occurs in people with Down syndrome. It may be mild, it may be severe. As you can see here, uh, the, the distributions of IQ scores are lower in people with Down syndrome than in people without. So in the general population, we, we assign the mean value of 100 to IQ scores, and we have a standard deviation of 15. So anything 70 or below, and that's a rough ballpark, is considered intellectual disability.
there's also an increased risk of epilepsy. We'll do something to explain that in a few slides. But you see higher rates of epilepsy in people with Down syndrome uh, than in the general population. Another thing you see is increased risk of dementia. So now let's look at the data on the right rather than the left. Uh, this is showing us the proportion of people with Down syndrome uh, captured in this study who had dementia looking across different age groups. So each row is showing us different age groups. And what we can see here is that the proportion of people with dementia is exceedingly high in Down syndrome patients. This is because of the extra copy of chromosome 21. We will also explain this in just a couple of slides. There's also a reported increased risk of autism spectrum disorder. This seems to hold up. In the textbooks, you'll find an increased risk of ADHD, anxiety, and depression also reported for people with Down syndrome. However, recent evidence refutes this. That's why I have maybe written parenthetically there. So, depending on how life goes, all of us have a risk of anxiety and depression, and it doesn't seem to be any higher in people with Down syndrome. So, what's causing all of these changes from head to toe? Well, it has to do with a concept called gene dosage. Hopefully by now we appreciate that our ability to create proteins from genes is critical for proper survival. We have to make the right proteins in the right amount and put them in the right place. Our ability to make the right proteins in the right amount is in part a function of how many copies do we have of that gene. For the most part, we have two copies of each gene. One from mom, one from dad. Some genes exist in multiple copies, sure, but for the most part we'll just say Two is typical. What happens in the case of trisomy 21? Rather than having two copies of chromosome 21 genes, we have three copies. As a result, let's just pick any one gene of interest we now have 150% of the genetic material that is typical. If we have 150% of the DNA, that's likely to translate to, well, I'm sorry, it's likely to transcribe to 150% of the messenger RNA and thus 150% of the protein. So we're going to make a whole lot more of the proteins on chromosome 21. And if we don't have the right gene dosage, that's what this is, we're not going to make the right amount of proteins. And if we don't do that, function will not be optimal. But what about the other chromosomes? They're just fine, right? That's kind of true, except when it's not. All right, let's say uh, here's chromosome 21 over here. What about other chromosomes? We just have two copies. And of course they'd be much larger. Excuse uh, the, the lack of scaling here. So some other chromosome. Insert your number uh, of interest here. Maybe like chromosome 5. Cool. Pretend this is chromosome 5. Well, although I have the same amount of DNA, right, my gene dosage is presumably similar these chromosomes don't operate in isolation. There's a finite amount of transcriptional machinery. So, if I'm spending more time transcribing chromosome 21 than in a typical cell, that means I'll spend a little bit less time transcribing chromosome whatever this is over here. So we might expect a slight decrease in expression. That's one possibility. So, we have a finite amount of, let's say, the transcriptional and translational machinery. Machinery just means proteins, it just sounds cooler. 
As a result, I might expect to have lower levels of protein from what I encode on other chromosomes. Black over here showing us other chromosomes. The purple is just chromosome 21. Just kind of across the board, we expect 150% here. But let's keep in mind, chromosome 21 makes some genes like transcription factors. So what if I make a gene over here that's some transcription factor, right? Factor just means thing. So this is some protein that affects my, abil my ability to express some other genes. What if that transcription factor acts on this chromosome over here. Well, since I have 150% the level of this transcription factor, I'm now going to make 150% the level of whatever gene or genes this acts on. So, if genes on chromosome 21 promote the expression of genes on other chromosomes, I actually expect to see about 150% the amount of protein from these other chromosomes as well. So some genes will be increased, some will be decreased. Our gene dosage is thrown out of whack, not only for chromosome 21, but the other chromosomes that genes on chromosome 21 interact with. And that's kind of what this schematic over here is trying to tell us. There can be an increase or a decrease in expression on other chromosomes besides chromosome 21. And remember, proteins do everything for us. So we're going to see a change in essentially every function. We're going to see alterations uh, in, you know, myelination and just survival of neurons, the production of ion channels and neurotransmitter receptors are going to be thrown off. So everything is going to be thrown out of whack. And here's just a nice little table. I thought you might enjoy uh, a dense table of genes on chromosome 21. So while it's a small little chromosome, there's still a lot of genes on there. Relevant to us is that first gene, APP, the amyloid precursor protein. We'll talk more about this whenever we uh, cover Alzheimer's disease in this class. But the amyloid precursor protein is one of those genes on chromosome 21. And the amyloid precursor protein, we believe, creates the protein that causes Alzheimer's disease. This is debatable. Some people listening might disagree. Fair enough. But certainly familial cases of Alzheimer's disease have mutations that increase the production of amyloid beta. And guess what? Invariably, people with Down syndrome develop Alzheimer's disease because on chromosome 21, we have APP, the amyloid precursor protein, which we're going to make at 150% the normal levels. So, very briefly, if we have an extra copy of chromosome 21, we're going to have an, a 50% increase in the amount of amyloid precursor protein. This is just a protein that sits in the surface of cells, but relevant to Alzheimer's disease, this gets cut up to make a sticky protein called amyloid beta, and this will eventually form those plaques that we see in Alzheimer's disease and in the brains of people with Down syndrome. They make 150% the amount of amyloid beta and thus rapidly develop plaques. That's why we'll see early onset Alzheimer's disease, invariably, in people with Down syndrome. There's also a change in the expression of another protein relative to I'm sorry, relevant to Alzheimer's disease called tau. Tau is a microtubule binding protein and helps hold microtubules together. It 
It does a little more than that, but we'll say that's what it does. Now, there are many versions of tau, and tau has these microtubule binding repeats that helps it stick to microtubules. So within the cell, I didn't leave myself much room. I'm going to make this an uglier, kind of peanut-shaped cell now, so I got a little space. All right, so scattered throughout, we got microtubules, and they radiate out from the center. The microtubule stability depends on uh, these microtubule-associated proteins that bind and, and help hold the tubulin together. One example is tau, and you find tau in the axon of neurons. So it's a very important microtubule binding protein for neurons. It comes in different versions. If I have four repeats, I stick, because I have an additional binding site, a whole lot better than the tau with only three repeats. These are my microtubule binding repeats, so the more repeats, the better I stick. In Down syndrome, uh, there's a, a change in the expression of this uh, protein, I think it's called DERK1. It's an RNA processing protein. So even though tau is an on chromosome 21, it still gets messed up because the RNA gets edited preferentially to form the three repeat version. This makes it float around rather than stick to microtubules. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but just to oversimplify, it's gonna to start to stick together and form these things called uh, tau tangles, or paired helical filaments, or neurofibrillary tangles. These are the intracellular globs of junk that we see in Alzheimer's disease. So let's have a look here. Uh, the top left is just showing us post-mortem brain samples from someone with Alzheimer's disease in a control, age match control. So the brain is smaller in Alzheimer's disease, also Down syndrome. Uh, if we look on the bottom, this is showing us the plaques. So they applied um, a, a stain that sticks into the amyloid plaques. And we see them if they're there. So we see a whole bunch of plaques outside the cell. We see a bunch of these neurofibrillary tangles inside the cell. What do these do? Well, it's kind of debatable, but we'll just simplify things a bit and say if tau is sticking to itself and not the microtubules, Microtubules fall apart. Microtubules, by the way, that's how we move stuff down the axon. And the axon doesn't make protein. If we can't move stuff down the axon, we starve our synapses of protein. And proteins do everything for us. So the synapse is screwed. There's a little debate on that, and we'll go through it a bit more in Alzheimer's disease. For now, what we need to appreciate is that in the brains of people with Down syndrome, because of those, that change in gene dosage, we see a whole bunch of APP, which creates a whole bunch of A-beta and makes plaques. Those aren't a good thing. We also see a change in that tau protein, which creates neurofibrillary tangles and in some way changes intracellular transport of proteins. Axonal trafficking is going to suffer as a result. What else might be going on in Down syndrome? Well, again, it's all about gene dosage, but now we need to consider another gene. In this case, a sodium-potassium chloride co-transporter. Tons of fun to say. NKCC1. It's a co-transporter. So, what this is going to do is bring in Sodium, potassium, and two chloride ions. <clears throat> NKCC1, even though it's not on chromosome 21, is expressed at about 150% the normal level in Down syndrome. Likely there's some transcription factor that stimulates its expression. Um, don't believe me, of course. Let's have a look at the data. So the bottom left data here, this is showing us Western blot analysis of post-mortem brain samples from age mesh controls and then five folks with Down syndrome. And what you'll notice here, that stain, the, the, the band 
for NKCC1 is much darker in Down syndrome cases than control. That tells us there's more protein there. Actin is what we call a loading control, so we kind of do a ratio of NKCC1 to actin. Anywho, you can look at the quantification below, and the typical elevation is about 150%. So, rather than having, oh, let's say two copies of this, I'm going to go ahead and put an additional one. So what are we doing? Well, we're pulling in a whole lot more chloride as a result. Normally, we should have very low levels of chloride inside and much higher levels of chloride outside. This way, whenever we apply something like, oh, I don't know, GABA, for example, this is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it's inhibitory because it binds to chloride channels. And when these open, chloride flows in to make the cell, we'll say, more negatively charged. That's close enough. But it makes it harder to fire an action potential. The cell should become less active. What happens in the case of Down syndrome when we have this extra copy and we increase intracellular chloride levels? Well, now chloride doesn't flow in as readily. And in fact, because the cell has that negative membrane potential at rest, when we apply GABA, chloride actually leaves, making the cell more positive. So now we take an inhibitory neurotransmitter like GABA and turn it into an excitatory one. How are we ever going to decrease neuronal activity. This would of course explain the increased risk of epilepsy because neurons are more excitable. They have no way of inhibiting one another. GABA isn't inhibitory anymore. Don't believe me, let's have a look at the data over here. These are recordings of spontaneous activity in slices from wild type mice and then a Down syndrome mouse model. In this case they created the trisomy 21, but a mouse version. The top recordings, there's a little bit of noise of course, because we're just kind of recording cell attached, and you'll see a couple of blips. Those are action potentials. That's active neurons. Then they apply different doses of GABA, and hopefully we remember that GABA is inhibitory, except when it's not. But in wild type, where there's nothing abnormal about the mice, it's just your run-of-the-mill mouse, applying GABA silences the neuron. And that's what GABA should do. No more spikes. Look over on the right now, in panel A, that uh, TS65DN, or whatever it says. That's the Down syndrome model. Notice what happens as you go from top to bottom, whenever we apply higher doses of GABA. That bottom panel there should be silent, but that's where you see the greatest level of activity. You put GABA on to the Down syndrome mouse model, it's off to the races, firing action potentials because GABA is now excitatory. So that could explain the epilepsy. It also explain the loss of neurons that we see. That's in panel C here on these data. Uh, these are back to human beings here, so control on top, people with Down syndrome on the bottom. Nu N is just this nuclear protein in neurons, so it just shows us neurons. The brown blobs are neurons. You see a reduction in neurons in postmortem samples uh, from people with Down syndrome. That could be because of excitotoxicity. How can I silence a neuron? I can't. This might also explain the intellectual disability as well, because the way that we figure out how the world works is neurons that fire together, wire together. We learn that fire is hot. We look at fire, there's fire, we touch it, hot. The neurons that represent fire are active at the same time the neurons that represent pain are. So now when we think fire, we think, well that's hot and painful. We navigate the world, and we learn to navigate it through associative learning. Associative learning requires that neurons who fire together, wire together. So the activity of neurons should be based on what's going on in the world, 
not because GABA isn't doing its job. So you get inappropriate neuron firing, and neurons fire together for no good reason. So your ability to learn how the world works is impaired. So changes in gene dosage are going to create problems in all tissues. I've just kind of highlighted neurons because that's what the class is about. Now as far as treatments go, well, there's a laundry list of issues, and as such, there's a laundry list of treatments uh, available. Depends on what we find. The big thing that we need to do is have routine screening to detect common illnesses such as congenital heart defects or pulmonary infections and treat them as they arise. So congenital heart defects, surgery. Pulmonary infections might be antibiotics, right? So depending on the issue that we find, the appropriate treatment needs to be applied. And since there's um, more uh, problems than I can tell you about in the time that I have, uh, there's, again, more treatments than I have time to tell you about. So, um, be, but because of this increase in routine screening and better detecting of these uh, illnesses in people with Down syndrome, you can see here the life expectancy has increased dramatically uh, over the last greater than century or so. So now the life expectancy is somewhere in the ballpark of 60 years uh, or so. But of course, we're not going to escape that early onset dementia that will begin somewhere around the 40s, so somewhere in the fifth decade. Uh, as far as you're concerned, of course, you're going to be helping uh, manage those developmental delays and musculoskeletal issues. So some of the musculoskeletal issues, uh, you're, of course, going to work with strength and, and endurance training there in that case. And there's also an educational component where you uh, help teach optimal movement patterns. And I will not say anything more about it. I, I feel like a fraud just even saying those phrases. Because apparently, well, education is something that, that is important uh, to PTs. And education is important to me, too. So if I can help with your education on this topic by answering some questions, let me know. Fill out the questions box. I'll see you in class.